keep in mind when you're reading Lamentations that Jeremiah or the prophet or the author of this book written about the horrible conditions that the people of God experienced after the invasion by the Babylonians and uh, the deportation of most of them into Babylon. Remember, though, that these are the consequences of the sins of the people of God. The prophets, including Jeremiah from last semester, warned them and God gave them multiple opportunities to repent of their sins, and their sins included child sacrifice. So they haven't just been bad, they've been really bad, and they're suffering the consequences of their sins. They haven't repented. They refuse to repent. What does it mean to repent? Well, let's take a look at what we're reading today in the book of Acts. Peter has just finished his sermon on the day of Pentecost. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Remember, Peter has just hammered home to them over and over again. This is what you have done. You have killed the Messiah. You have killed the promised one. You crucified him. This is what you have done. He pushes it into their face. He doesn't soft pedal it. He doesn't take an approach that perhaps you hear in many of the homilies. You hear where the sins of the people aren't even mentioned out of a sense of maybe embarrassment. I'm really upset at how everything that we've learned about our devout Catholic brethren, all of the failures of their moral character and their Christian virtues that we've seen since COVID in particular have been totally ignored in the church. But Peter didn't do that. He shoved it in their face as to what they did. And it hurts them. And they are cut to the quick. And they say, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now in John, remember, Nicodemus says, what does it mean to be born again? And Jesus says you must be born of water and the Spirit, which is baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the two things that Peter is calling on them to do. Now, there are some arguments about the validity of baptism among the greater Christian church, including Protestants. The one thing we can all agree on is that the sacrament of baptism, the water, is useless if we don't cooperate with the grace that comes with it. And that grace that comes with water is the gift of the Spirit and is the Spirit encouraging us to repent, which means stop digging in your heels. Stop doing what the people of God did before the Babylonian invasion and captivity. Stop doing it until we begin to suffer, as Lamentation spells out. Stop and turn around. Now, in Greek... In Plato, this is called periagoge, periagogi, however it's pronounced. Intellectually, there's a whole tradition of this in Greek philosophy predating the Christian era, the turning around toward goodness and truth, the giving up your own selfish love of darkness. And then, of course, Jesus, Jesus himself talks about this in our reading from John. But before we get to that, Notice how in Psalm 7, the psalmist spells out, whoever is pregnant with evil conceives trouble and gives birth to disillusionment. In other words, there's a consequence to how you live. Whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. The trouble they cause recoils on them. Their violence comes down on their own heads. Hoist by their own petard is the expression from, I believe, Dr. Faustus, the play. Now, the other thing that bothers me about the modern church is I call it the heresy of inconsequentialism, the idea that there are no consequences to our behavior. It doesn't matter. Whatever. It's all good. Well, it's not all good. Just take a look around you. You might not believe in hell after death, but there certainly is a lot of hell in life. And we get more and more of that if we refuse to turn toward the light. If we refuse the cleansing waters that baptism represents, 
and the repentance that the Spirit offers us. So when we look at the reading from John, toward the end in particular, this is the whole dialogue with Nicodemus, and there are many things here that are mysterious and hard to understand, and of course I can't talk about all of them or I'd be talking all day. Whoever believes in him, Jesus says, meaning the Son who has come into the world, who, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now that's interesting. He's not saying if you don't believe in me, you will not be saved. He's saying your refusal to believe your intransigence, your refusal to repent, your stony, cold heart is already a consequence and a sign of your disbelief. And he goes, and this is, to me, this is fascinatingly psychologically perceptive. Even if, as some people say, all of Scripture is just fiction, it's amazing fiction, because this is so deeply true this is the verdict, our Lord says. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. The light has come into the world, but we prefer darkness because we prefer our deeds of evil. People don't refuse to repent out of ignorance. People refuse to repent out of A, a perverse rejection of what is good, true, and beautiful. Now, this doesn't mean it doesn't include me and you. This doesn't mean that it's all those bad people who have refused to repent. If you know anything about yourselves and you struggle in your life to try to be even good, much less Christian, you know how hard it is and how there's something in us that rejects that. There is something in us that turns toward our own darkness and away from the light. The light has come into the world, but men have preferred darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. We don't want it to be known who we are in the depths of our of our dungeon. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Now this is important. I'm going to wrap this up, but let me talk about two little examples. Sometimes I say bad words, especially when I get angry. When we were touring with my Theater of the Word shows, we would set up sound systems in churches and it would always be frustrating. And I would have my microphone on. And if I cursed, sometimes the mic would be live and it would pick it up. So I said to myself, I'd better go around acting like I've always got a headset mic on the side of my face that's hot, that will broadcast whatever I say. The other thing is the uh, Ring of Gyges, which appears in Plato in the Republic and might have been one of the sources for the Lord of the Rings. The Ring of Gyges is a story that if there's a ring that makes you invisible, what's the first thing you'd do? Well, you'd go into the girl's locker room if you're a guy. And the point of this is people do bad only because they can be seen. If they couldn't be seen doing bad and if they could get away with it, they'd do bad all the time. Why? Because we have no integrity. And this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying... If you love, if you, if you hate the light, you will do evil. If you do evil, you hate the light. And you will not want it to shine upon you. You will want to remain invisible in the darkness because you're ashamed of your evil deeds. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. In other words, in the sight of God symbolically means our whole selves with and an integral completeness is known in all eternity who we really are, way down deep. Do we really love the light? 
then we repent of those parts of us that still cling to the darkness, which is a lifelong process. And so, look at what Jesus says about truth, especially in the Gospel of John, and ask yourselves if you are people you know are committed to the lie. We are being lied to, and people have embraced lies. People want to live by their own special, peculiar fictions. And yet they have a sense that the lies that they give themselves to are really lies, and they get their dander up if you try to expose the actual truth. Look around you. I'm not going to spell this out. It happens a lot in politics. People love the lie and are devoted to it. Don't be like that. Try to be what I try to be. I try not to say bad words when I'm angry. I try to have integrity. I try to have a oneness of character because I love the truth and I love the light. That's why I went from being an atheist to a Christian. Because it's true. And if it's not true, and if it doesn't communicate the core truth of reality and the core truth at the bottom of our being, then we should burn down all the churches and throw all the Bibles into the bonfire. If it's not true, reject it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. And everyone who is of the truth hears his voice, as he says to Pontius Pilate. Follow the truth, and you will have to repent. You will have to turn from darkness to the light. That's what this whole book is about. If you get only that from this class, you will have gotten the most important thing. Because the truth is love. Because God is love, so turn toward that.